All right, Frank, I'm taking over. Time for you to drop that knowledge on us here, buddy. I tell you what, it's been a pretty wild last couple days in the hockey world talking about potential signings and one player in particular, Evander Kane. And the NHL sent out a memo yesterday to all 32 teams specifically about Evander Kane. What did it say? How much of an impact will it have on any team looking to potentially sign him? Why I think it's really cooled things off. You think about the flurry of interest that began in, in the beginning of the week with Evander Kane formally becoming an unrestricted free agent on Sunday. I'm told as many as 16 teams had talked to the Kane camp and he had conducted interviews with teams. There were calls from players on these teams trying to recruit uh, Evander Kane. And then this memo comes out on Wednesday from the NHL head office, which basically says the league has you know, partied an independent investigation that will now look into exactly what happened with Evander Kane's cross-border travel over the holiday period. And so what's alleged is that Kane tested positive for COVID-19 on December 21st while playing for the AHL San Jose Barracuda and then crossed into Canada uh, on a trip home on December 29th on a flight. That breaks uh, Canadian Quarantine Act rules and and regulations uh, and so that would also be out of line uh, to travel without medical clearance as per the nhl's covid 19 protocol kane still on an nhl contract at the time so they have jurisdiction and the interesting part of the memo was that the nhl basically hinting and i've printed the memo in full on dailyfaceoff.com that kane could be subject to an NHL disciplinary hearing with Commissioner Bettman should they have facts here that establish that he did indeed violate the protocol again. So why is that significant? Well, Kane was already suspended for one uh, significant COVID violation back on October 18th for 21 games to start the season, forfeited almost $1.8 million in salary for submitting a fake COVID-19 vaccination card. So, Mike, you've been around a long time. You know how the NHL uh, discipline system works. If he indeed had another significant violation, well, we could be dealing with instead of a 21-game suspension the first time around, what does the second one look like? It's all hypothetical at this point, but mm -hmm. that's what has given teams pause. What if you're looking at a 40-game suspension for Evander Kane? Well, then would teams still want to sign him? I mean, there's an awful lot here. It sounds like the NHL hasn't pretty wide leeway to do what they like. I mean, could a, could a team still sign him now without having that information? That is possible, yes. It, a team could just say, you know what? We'll take whatever risk comes with this. We believe strongly in Evander Kane, and we're going to sign him right now without having that information. The NHL uh, hasn't advised teams to hold off or anything like that. However, I just don't see a team being willing to take on that risk and the potential PR hit that comes with signing a player uh, with Evander Kane who has so much baggage that comes with him if, in fact, you're not really going to be able to use him much in the regular season. I think maybe depending on what kind of discipline, if any, comes from it, that a team might be willing to take a stab a little bit closer to uh, the trade deadline. Like, let's say... Uh, the NHL makes a determination and says, hey, um, you know, you're suspended for 40 games. And that means he can play the final three of the regular season and the playoffs. Well, then that's a bit of a different story as well. But the money that you'd sign him for now would all be going to the NHL's emergency player assistance fund as part of the suspension. So you'd be paying money, not having the player at your disposal and taking the PR hit. I think there's a lot of teams at the moment. We saw the report from Kevin Weeks on Wednesday that said that it's down to the final two. We believe the Edmonton Oilers are one of those teams. A number of teams were in and then out that they probably just hold on and say, let's get more information. The NHL is in, in the process of gathering that at the moment. They think that it shouldn't take too long, but it all depends on the cooperation that they get from Evander Kane and his agent and Dan Milstein. We'll see where all this goes. It's possible that Kane signs in the, in the short term, but I think teams have sort of cooled on the idea until they know more. It's murky. 
there's a lot going on there. Uh, I can't imagine that uh, any team's lining up to do things without at least some modicum of, uns of certainty moving forward. Uh, earlier this week, tragic news uh, out of Connecticut with uh, the death of 16-year-old Teddy Balkind, and it was an on-ice incident on the ice. And uh, Frank, the one thing in my life that scared me when I played with skate blades terrified me. And I did everything I could to protect my neck and trying to find the right things I can even for my daughters while they're playing. And it makes me wonder, is USA Hockey considering any potential equipment changes? Yeah, and just to your point, just heartbreaking news. Um, Teddy Balkan, uh, you know, you see an incident like that and, and you read the report about uh, certainly a skate blade cut that that uh, resulted in loss of life. It, you know, you, you can't even wrap your brain around what that means. Mm. But the timing of it is interesting because USA Hockey, the governing body of the sport here in the country, has gathered for their annual winter meetings in Florida. And it's certainly a topic of conversation and a big one at that, um, certainly with their protective safety equipment committee that's meeting. Uh, one of the things that's on the table is potentially making net guards mandatory for all youth players up to age 18. Um, there's just been lots of different uh, studies and, and information that the committee is still gathering at the moment, which pieces of equipment actually work, some testing that needs to be done. Uh, you know, they don't want to set up a situation where some players try to skirt it and simply uh, just have a piece of cloth on their neck. Uh, they found actually the committee that there's some pieces of equipment that are out there that could be more detrimental when wearing, that the skate blade bounces off and actually could do more harm uh, depending on the type of equipment. So they're trying to get to the bottom of it. It's something that's of high priority, um, a, a catastrophic injury like that, uh, certainly with regards to a skate cut, hasn't happened all that often in the in the USA Hockey's history. So they're working on it and, and certainly want to make some changes and some recommendations that would keep everyone safer. I know you mentioned it's a concern for you as a coach yeah. of, of eight U players here for me. Like it's one of the big things that I think about. You see players jump into a dog pile, uh, certainly around the goalie, skates flying in the air, collisions like yeah. It makes your heart sink, makes your heart sink for the Balkan family uh, in Connecticut. Love to see the response from NHL players, particularly putting their sticks out for Teddy Balkan and the response on social media. But I think everyone's concerned here, especially from USA Hockey on down on keeping everyone safe. There's a requirement they already have with Hockey Canada to wear a neck guard. I think Sweden has one as well. USA Hockey certainly could be next. Yeah, it's uh, it hit home. Hits home, you know. My goalie partner in Lowell, Massachusetts, when I played there in the Devils organization, Jeffrey Z, came, you know, just really close to having his neck um, sliced in a bad way. Of course, Clint Malarchuk, uh, life saved on the ice. This is something that I think equipment-wise could see a lot of improvement, Frank. And I hope that it comes for everybody. Uh, thanks for dropping your knowledge on us. This has been yet another segment of Icebreakers with Frank Saravalli.